I'm Victoria Galley. And I'm Robert O'Brien. And today we're going to be talking about the global economy and impact of coronavirus and what are the different impacts locally here as well of when a virus spreads. Um, so, Robert, tell me a bit about yourself. Well, I'm a professor of political science at McMaster. I've been here for around 20 years. I teach international relations courses, a lot of courses on uh, global political economy, and also I teach a number of courses on climate change. Yes, so that's how we met, is that you're my professor here at McMaster throughout uh, my uh, briefly through my undergrad and then also during my master's in international relations. So we talked more about um, what climate change and the impact that it has on the economy and what are those impacts. But also there's a, a virus going on right now, coronavirus, that is impacting the economy as well. Uh, so can you tell me a bit about coronavirus? Sure. It was first um, detected in Wuhan, China in uh, December of 20, 2019. Uh, since then, it's spread uh, throughout uh, China and now has uh, spread to over 60 countries of the world, and it looks like it's probably going to spread to almost every country in the world. It's a, um, it mainly hits the respiratory system, so um, people will have coughs and fever. Um, it has a mortality rate of about 2%, so if we compare that with other things, let's say the common flu is, is under 1%, so... More, more people uh, who get it will, um, will, will die from it. Um, but it's not as uh, lethal as, let's say, SARS was when SARS swept uh, through the world. All right. So um, how does that make an impact on the economy? Well, that's uh, an excellent question. The answer is really complicated. <laughs> it's a big one. <laughs> yeah. So there's two, two uh, things. So one is the impact it's had on China. And then because of China's relations to the rest of the world, it has an impact on them. And then the other is the degree to which it's going to spread outside of China, so how right. far it gets. With regards to China, um, China is really central to the global economy, and there's a number of different ways. So it's really kind of the workshop of the world. So many things that we, that we use, that are produced, uh, at least part of it comes from China. Um, and it's also, uh, China is a huge consumer of goods, so it, it um, imports uh, many raw materials, it imports um, many pieces that are then put into uh, other things that are produced. China is about 17% of the global economy, so when it shuts down for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, that ripples through throughout the world. So... Um, you know, there's starting to be shortages on some some parts of things. So a concept that's useful here is the uh, global commodity chain, right? Things are produced in different parts of the world, and then they're brought together in a final assembly, and they're and they're sold. So what that means is, countries or companies like Apple, for example, rely on China to produce uh, parts for its phones. So if the factories in China close down, it means it's Apple can't get the supplies that it needs to to build its phones. It's not just phones, it's many things. It's uh, toys, it's drugs, it's um, other manufactured goods. So when the Chinese factories close, that creates supply problems for, for other, uh, uh, other companies. And then, as I was mentioning before, China's a huge consumer of things. So um, certain countries like Australia are really reliant on China to buy commodities such as coal. Canada exports things like... Um, uh, oil, minerals, uh, different types of uh, agricultural products. So if Chinese consumption slows, then that means that uh, we're unable to sell our products there. Right, and then we're seeing... Do you want more? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sure, if you want to give more. Well, it's just because there's lots of factors. So another big factor is the movement of people, right? right. Because, of the, because of the disease, we're starting to see clamp down travel restrictions and also people themselves are deciding not to to travel so China provides about a little under 20 percent of the world's tourists so and that creates hundreds of billions of dollars of, of money that flows to other countries right so if those people all stay home mm -hmm. then that devastates the tourist industry so countries like especially in Europe countries like Italy uh, France, the United Kingdom, that rely a lot on Chinese tourism, those tourists aren't coming. It's also um, difficult because Chinese tourists tend to be 
uh, they tend to spend a lot of money. So per mm -hmm. capita, they spend more money than other tourists do. So the drop off in the tourist trade uh, really hits uh, particular particular countries. It's estimated that last year there was about seven million Chinese visits to Europe. Wow. So if that cuts down, then that really impacts the European economy. And then for young people, the issue is students, right? There's lots of Chinese yeah. foreign students. Some countries, such as Australia, have really um, come to rely on Chinese students to, to finance uh, Australian universities. So if those students can't get back to Australia to uh, enroll in courses, that really hurts the um, Australian economy. Right. And so we're also seeing, I just saw images from Seattle where they're completely sold out in supermarkets of things like hand sanitizer, masks and toilet paper. Mm -hmm. And so we're also seeing a strain locally, um, just not just on the import and export, but on day to day stress over needing to stock up on supplies. Um, so do you think that that uh, is really spread by fear mongering in the media or do you think it's it's a smart thing to do to think that you need to, to stock up? I think that uh, it's primarily driven by fear. Yeah. I'm not, and ignorance, and I'm not so sure it's the media that's driving it. I, I think people just respond if they're scared and they don't have the right information. I mean, the case of the run on masks is really interesting mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. So one reason is uh, half of the masks in the world are made in China, China <laughs> right? Which already, uh, if the factories there are closing or they're not producing very much, then it's going to reduce supply of masks. And the other thing that's interesting about it is that people, um, I think many people are rushing to get masks when they really don't need the masks, right. right? If you have the disease, it's really good to wear a mask because it means you won't, you spread less of it to other people. If you don't have the disease and on a day-to-day -day basis, the mask really doesn't serve any function. Right, because then you're touching your face more and then you're picking it up through touch and then you're yeah. putting it yeah. towards yourself. Yeah. So the biggest message we can give today is wash your hands. I think that's a really good one. Um, but also, so you mentioned Australia. So tell me about how the structure of a country then impacts the spread of the disease. Well, I think um, what the disease does is it reveals the stresses and the problems that countries already have. Mm -hmm. So for example, in authoritarian countries, which like to control information and aren't honest with people about things, the disease reveals the dangers of authoritarianism. So yeah. in China, for example, at the beginning of the crisis, you had public health officials that were trying to warn authorities that something was going on and they weren't listening or they weren't responsive to it. Uh, I think in Iran, we see a similar kind of problem where it spread quickly through the country and authorities weren't honest with people about, uh, about the spread and about the kinds of steps they should take to, to deal with it. In other countries, I think it's going to reveal the uh, problems with countries that either have very weak public health systems or don't have public health systems. Yeah. So the American case is really interesting, right? Because yeah. there's lots of reports there of people not going to get tested because they're going to get, um, uh, they have to pay for the testing. Even people who have insurance, many of them will have very high deductibles. So let's say $1,000. So to go and get a test, it costs $3,000. There's still $1,000 out of pocket for it. Or uh, people may not want to go test, get tested or they may not want to go to the doctors because they can't lose a day of work or they right. may get fired. So it reveals, you know, those countries that don't have kind of support systems for people, they're more likely to have the disease spread through the population. Right. Even here we have service workers that don't have sick days that they are able to go to the doctor to get tested, even if it is available. Um, and I think that the case of the U.S. is really important because they've created this maximized capitalistic society where they're, you know, humans are a commodity and product that where they don't have access to health care or um, sick days and time off to get tested. So I think that it's, it's a bit scary that the way the system set themselves up for failure, essentially. Um, so I also saw recently, if you can speak on it, in Iran, um, they just released uh, prisoners in order to stop the spread of the disease. Do you think that um, that is an interesting aspect of, let's say, if the university had a spread and they decided to cancel, do you think that's kind of along the same lines? Um, can you just speak on that? I can't say anything about that. Like, I don't know. Case. That just happened. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I can't speak on that. Um, but what I can say is I think that um, uh, people have to give more thought about how they can deal with this under certain circumstances. So mm -hmm. um, 
for example, I know some universities have been thinking about, uh, you know, if they were to suspend classes for a couple of weeks, how could they still function, right? right. Like, would it be possible for professors to give their classes virtually and to have people submit things uh, online in order to um, have kind of a cooling off period so that people aren't uh, aren't spreading the spreading the virus? Yeah, so speaking of worrying about spreading the virus here at McMaster, we just had a local case of an individual that self-isolated um, to make sure they didn't maximize the spread of their uh, contamination, though that uh, student tested negative. Um, how do you think that that impacts, uh, like, would impact the university if they did have a, a spread of disease here? Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's fantastic that that su- student self-isolated and self-identified uh, themselves. It's exactly the kinds of uh, responsible behavior that you need in a in a crisis like this, um, I think it would it would pose challenges for the university if uh, a couple of cases or even just one case was um, was revealed. And I'm not sure that we've done enough yet to think about how we would respond uh, right. to that. Um, I know my own daughter is uh, at uh, school in an American university at the moment in California, and um, they've asked all of their faculty to. Um, start preparing with um, software and uh, mm-hmm. test out different approaches that they could try and use if the virus uh, spread and let's say if they cancel big, big lectures or, or things like that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, overall, do you have any final thoughts on coronavirus? Well, um, maybe back to the U.S. case and, and the Canada case. I think it shows the shortcomings of running a system that is completely market-based or really heavily market-based. So we find, for example, um, hospitals are often run so that there's no slack in them, right? Right. The hospitals are on an ordinary basis. They're already full. There's already waiting lines or there's difficulty with accessing it. But when you have something like this come through and you pile that on top of a system that is already stretched, then I think uh, you're going to run into problems. The important point to note is that, I mean, hospitals are run that way by design, design, right? Right. They're run to kind of be efficient. Mm -hmm. Um, That's seen as being a good thing, to not have any spare capacity in the system. When we have an epidemic or a health scare like that, we find that that's kind of a short-sighted strategy, right? We need to think about spending some more money up front to try and prepare for these kinds of uh, health emergencies. Otherwise, when they come, you're you're scrambling to try and respond to them, and I think that's when when people start to to panic a bit. I don't know, did you see a video on recently about uh, people kind of going to a? I think it was a Costco or some oh, sort of store with that huge lineup. Yeah, it's yeah. like a three minute video of a line at Costco where they start at the back of the store, and it's about fifteen minutes after opening, and then every person has like water or what whatever, um, and so this person is just walking past the line, and in the minute the video just goes on and on and on because Costco's are obviously massive, but um, yeah, I think that that's something that we'll eventually worry about here if we do have a death toll, which is what I referenced in the beginning of this video about Seattle, is because they're running out of things like toilet paper because they've had six deaths now in that area, um, and so people are coming quite concerned about going out in public um so i i lost my train of thought as something else but uh yeah i just think it's really interesting the other uh, media role as well because if we see this uh constant live coverage and how we're asking questions of if our politicians are doing enough if our healthcare system is going to be good enough and we're seeing a day-to-day live death toll updates um but we don't see that for something as serious and kills more people like climate change. Mm. So do you think um, that if theoretically we took on the same day-to-day coverage um, like we are with coronavirus as we do with climate change, do you think we'd see people taking more serious action or do you think it would still be discounted as that was a single one-off event? Well, I think the thing about um, coronavirus um, that's different about climate change is that Um, it seems to happen very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. It's very immediate, so people are getting sick quickly, they're dying quickly, and I think that's one of the challenges that we face with climate change is that because uh, it seems to be a slower process, it seems to be drawn out over a long time period, it's harder to get that sense of of urgency. But maybe the one area where it overlaps is with the coronavirus or any kind of health uh, problem, 
causes us to look at fundamental structures, right, of how we organize our society and may help us think about, like, how do we prepare for these big disasters? And, mm -hmm. and maybe it's better to act now, whether it's doing something on hospitals or stockpiling drugs or stockpiling materials um, in order to deal with an epidemic. Same thing with climate change, right? It's better to act now, to do something now, instead of waiting for uh, the worst effects of, of it to overwhelm us. Yeah, absolutely. So I think a lot of people, although we talked about mass media coverage, are still getting a lot of their ideas of what a pandemic uh, looks like from movies. And so we see the movie uh, Contagion went from being like 176 most watched movie in 2019 to second mm -hmm. ranked this mm -hmm. year. Uh, so what would be your advice to viewers and to people trying to get more information about what it would realistically look like um, if it were to hit our area and what you should do to actually prepare? Well, with regards to Contagion, I really enjoyed that movie. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and I rewatched it as well in the last yeah. couple of weeks. That's why it's ranked number two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's, that's, of course, very, very far to what we're confronting. I mean, that, that was a, um, a disease that have, had a very high uh, mortality rate and mm -hmm. spread uh, very fast. I think that movie tells us a little bit about what might happen, not with coronavirus, but something could happen in the future, right? Mm -hmm. So, again, it, it would be good to take preparations to prepare for that kind right. of thing. With regards to our own situation, um, you know, your your advice about hand washing is 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 the advice to to follow and not uh, not to panic, right? It's right. not something um, if we look at the numbers, uh, you know, yes, there there are people who will um, uh, suffer from it and there are people who will um, pass away from it, but um, the numbers aren't aren't huge, and if people take the precautions, then they can um, they can ward off the the worst effects of the virus. Yeah, and I think the most concerning thing when I think about just telling people to wash their hands is why was no one washing their hands before? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So on that note, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for I really appreciate it. I think it's really important, especially after just having a case here at McMaster, to really get out positive information about what we can do and, and not the alarmism and really uh, send out positive notes about uh, what individuals can do and, you know, the overhaul of our capitalist structure to create better health care and to not utilize people as products. Thanks, viewers, for watching. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell.